This distinctive building has many evocative stories to tell that capture the history of Dorchester over the last 150 years. It, it marks the beginning of compulsory education at a national level and is the work of England's greatest architect of the Victorian period. It symbolises the impact of a radical vicar and his sister on the appearance of the village and the life of his parishioners. And it remains a focal point for the activities of the community. It was built to provide a school for the girls and the infants of the village. There was already a small girls' school on the site on a piece of land at the corner of Cheney Lane and Queen Street, which had been given by the Earl of Abingdon in 1836. We don't know what that school looked like, but it was in existence when the Reverend William McFarlane was appointed as vicar in 1856 with the mission to transform religious life in the village. McFarlane was a bachelor. He had a substantial fortune inherited from his father and that money enabled him to build a new vicarage to provide suitable accommodation for himself and his spinster sister, Jessie, who acted as his housekeeper. And once established in the village, they recommenced the restoration of the abbey, which had petered out due to a lack of funds. And his architect was George Gilbert Scott, who, of course, was a leading advocate for the Gothic revival and had the largest architectural practice in the country and possibly in Europe. Scott had already carried out extensive commissions for the Gibbs family down the road in Clifton Hamden, where he'd remodeled the church, built a new vicarage and designed the bridge over the River Thames. In Oxford, he designed the Martyrs Memorial at the very outset of his career and a striking new chapel for Exeter College. And amongst his works elsewhere in the country, the Albert Memorial and the Station Hotel at St Pancras in London are the most celebrated. Scott was knighted in 1872, and this was the year that his school in Dorchester was opened. He was involved continuously in all of McFarlane's projects in the village for 20 years, starting with the restoration of the North Isle of the Abbey in 1858, and clearly they had a close personal friendship. McFarlane was convinced that a lack of educational opportunities was one of the reasons for the neglect of Anglican religion in the village, and he took immediate steps to address this deficiency. Both he and Jesse played an active role in teaching at the existing girls' school, and in 1869 he paid for a new school and a chapel of ease in the outlying hamlet of Burkett, so that the people there didn't have to make the journey to Dorchester every day to meet their spiritual and educational needs. In the following year, 1870, the Forster Education Act began the process of compulsory elementary schooling for children aged between five and 13, and the McFarlands seized the opportunity to commission Scott to build a new school for the village. In February, 1871, the girls were moved into the Abbey Guest House and the existing school was demolished. The foundation stone was laid on the 22nd of June and on the 7th of January, 1872, the building was formally opened by the Bishop of Oxford. The plans signed by Scott survive in the County Record Office. They show a large room for 72 girls, partially screened from a space for 36 infants, with a small classroom in a lower wing placed at right angles at the West End. The windows were deliberately placed high up so that the children weren't distracted by the goings on in the outside world. And the brickwork is carefully laid in English bond. Uh, that's alternate rows of headers and stretches. It's an old fashioned bond probably deliberately chosen to emphasize its Gothic design. The building was heated by two cold stoves. It cost a total of 950 pounds, of which two thirds was provided by the McFarlands. Particular attention was paid to the east gable of the building. 
That faced onto the orchard of the vicarage across the road. And unfortunately, Scott's actual design for this elevation is missing from the collection in the record office. But it's clear that it was meant to give a really distinguished public face to the McFarland's generosity. It was framed by the oversailing roof supported on an elaborate decorative open timber truss and it was topped by a metal finial and the pointed windows with the circular window above give it just that gothic flavour um, while the flanking buttresses are emphasised by the tumbled brickwork at their top. The full effect was sadly lost in 1976 when the truss and the finial were removed but the supporting feet are still in place and the finial is safely stored in the village. It's highly desirable that the gable end is properly reinstated when the building is restored. The smaller gable at the end of the rear wing is still in place and that echoes the form of the original principal gable with the addition of housing the school bell and great prominence is given to the decorative chimney stacks which serve the stoves in both the schoolroom and the smaller classroom. Scott had been responsible for the design of the new high roof over the nave of the abbey, and he made sure that the roof of the new schoolroom with its substantial curved braces was the dominant feature of the interior. By contrast, the roof of the flanking classroom was given a simpler profile with straight braces and smaller timbers. When it was completed, the school must have been a distinctive addition to the architectural character of Dorchester. Its Gothic form heralded McFarland's adherence to high church principles and its presence in such a prominent location announced the importance of education to the life of the village, an importance which increased markedly as the century progressed. In 1888, there were so many on the school roll that the partition in the schoolroom was removed. In 1895, a separate boys' school was built at a cost of £720. The architect was Samuel Johns of Wallingford, and in 1900, he added a new classroom wing to the girls' school. It was comparatively plain in its design, with none of the decorative flourishes which characterised uh, Scott's building, and it cost £350. In 1932, when the new mixed secondary school was built on the other side of Queen Street, the girls' school became the primary school and the boys' school was converted into a kitchen and canteen with a building for woodwork classes placed between them. In 1959, the building was finally closed as a school when the secondary school was relocated to Berensfield and the primary school moved across the road. As a Church of England school, the ownership of the building reverted to the diocese but in 1969, they sold it to the County Council. And at that time, the Parish Council was looking for a replacement for the old village hall on the corner of Malthouse Lane. A public meeting in November 1970 resolved to approach the County Council to buy the old girls' school. But it wasn't until May 1973 that it was finally purchased for £2,200 and it began its new life as the village hall. Over the 150 years of its existence, this building has served the village well, but it's now in need of modernization. And this will provide a welcome opportunity to reinstate some of the features which formed such a pleasing part of the original design, and it would honor the memory of Scott. <laughs>